Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome along to our vaccine forum. Um, for those of you who, of you who don't know me, my name's Peter Milne um, from the Clifford Craig Foundation. Now, we have some, um, just to assure everyone here tonight, we are following the hotel's COVID safety measures, um, and we also know your names, who's in the room. Um, the format for tonight, Professor Flanagan will speak shortly about um, the COVID vaccine developments. Uh, we'll then take questions, so please have questions ready and feel free to ask questions. It's your opportunity. And the CEO of St Luke's Health, Paul Lupo, will wind up proceedings. I received an email today uh, which said 2020 has been a year that we could never have envisaged. And I thought, what an apt description it has been. Um, but fortunately, though, through the wonders of medical research, um, it's given us hope that 2021 uh, will be a much better year. Just a few weeks ago, we woke up to the wonderful news that a successful vaccine had been found for COVID-19 and that Pfizer-BioNTech had concluded their phase three study, which demonstrated 95% effectiveness against the virus. And since then, we've had another two vaccine trials returning excellent efficacy against the virus. And whilst we cherish the magnificent work of the scientists and researchers across the globe, who have dedicated their year to finding an answer to this wicked pandemic, there are many questions raised and uh, where we go to in the future. So we're very fortunate in this city to have a highly qualified head of infectious diseases uh, at the Launceston General Hospital, and I refer to Professor Katie Flanagan. Katie's been at the forefront of the fight against COVID-19, both at the local level to prepare our hospital for the impact of the virus, and also at the national level, where she's a member of the Australian Technical Advisory Group on Immunisations. So with our partners for tonight's forums at Luke's Health and the Examiner newspaper, we thought it would be opportune to ask Katie to come and provide an update on COVID-19 vaccines and where we're heading to in the future. So would you please put your hands together and welcome Professor Katie Flanagan. Okay, I, I hope my mic is working. Yes, it seems to be. Okay, look, it's such a pleasure to be here and to be able to give a talk in person. I've spent most of this year talking to a computer screen to lots of people and doing webinars and I did a big um, virtual conference last week across um, Australasia. So this is just so nice and um, very good to see you all appropriately distanced. And please, feel free to ask questions at the end and, and anything you want to ask me, if I can't answer it, I will soon tell you, but I'd be more than happy to take any questions. These are just my declarations. As Peter said, I'm on the TAGI, but I'm also leading their vaccine utilization and prioritization working group. So we're, my group is deciding who gets the vaccine and when. So I won't be able to tell you everything because uh, it's all a bit top secret at the moment, but we're working very hard to decide. Um, so this um, figure here just shows you what uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. And what you can see is this lovely diagram designed by my husband, who's actually in the audience, but he designs uh, the pictures for a lot of the papers that I write, um, because I can't do this kind of thing. Anyway, all the way around the edge, you can see the black um, molecule, and that's the spike protein. And that sits in a trimer, so that's three bits joined together. And it's got two different domains. So it's got an S1 domain at the end, and there on the end is the RBD domain, which is the receptor binding domain. And then you've got the S2 segment that sits through the membrane of the cell. We've then got the envelope and the, um, and the membrane proteins. And then inside, you can see the pink blobs, and they're the nuclear protein. And they're all the proteins that people are making vaccines against, because you have to have your target. But nearly every vaccine that's being developed is actually focusing on that spike protein. Now, the reason for that is that protein, which you can now see the crystallography three-dimensional structure of here on the left, binds to the human ACE2 receptor. So that's the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 receptor. So it binds to the receptor on the host cell, and that's how the virus is able to enter into the cell, because it undergoes a cleavage process and then binds with the surface and the virus gets into your cell. So as a result of that, most people are trying to target that spike protein to prevent the virus entering the cell. But just to talk about um, the vaccine in general, you need to understand what kind of immune response you're trying to generate. 
And the immune system is developed largely into innate immunity, that's your immediate um, immune response that occurs within hours. And that's normally um, associated with bits of that protein that are highly conserved and bind to receptors on our cells which um, don't have any memory to them. They just pick up whatever they see coming in as a danger signal and release a whole load of inflammatory mediators into the system which cause an innate immune response and to start to help to clear the virus. And what happens is there's these things called type 1 and type 3 interferons produced, first of all, and then they lead to a whole load of things called cytokines and chemokines. And they're just soluble substances that get into your bloodstream, but also into various systems of the body, the lungs, for example, as well, and cause inflammation and attract more cells. So that's your innate immune system. But in COVID, that type 1 and type 3 immune response is defective. It doesn't work properly. And what also happens is you get what's called a cytokine storm. And this is what you hear about people getting when they get severe respiratory distress. It's because of all this inflammation that's going on in their lungs and they can't breathe. And that can actually kill you, that cytokine storm. Um, the other focus is on the adaptive immune um, system. So that is the part of the immune system that actually takes days or weeks to be stimulated. And that's where you get your immune memory. Now, the main focus, you can see in this graphic here that there's a whole load of different subsets of cells involved. Now, most of us think about antibodies as being produced by vaccination. And at the top there, you can see B cells producing antibodies. And the big focus is on antibodies that can bind to that receptor binding domain of the spike protein and stop the virus from getting into the cell. And they're called neutralizing antibodies. And in the media, you'll see mention about neutralizing antibodies are produced, this is a good thing. Well, it absolutely is, um, and you want those neutralizing antibodies. You don't want ones that are non-neutralizing and that don't allow, don't prevent the entry. There's also things called CD8 cytotoxic T cells. Now, we also think that you really do need a T cell response as well as a B cell and antibody response to this virus. And so we're looking for vaccines that can make T cells get stimulated specific to the antigens such as the spike protein. The CD8 cytotoxic T cells will actually kill the virus. There's then... Um, there's then uh, follicular helper and Th2 cells. So these are other types of specialized cells, produce special cytokines, and they give B cell help and help the B cells to make antibodies. We then got um, Th1 and Th17 cells. So these are pro-inflammatory cells, produce certain cytokines, again, can help kill viral infected cells. But finally, there's a thing called Tregs, and these are regulatory T cells, and they are necessary to dampen the immune response. And, um, that is a very important part of the homeostatic response to any infection, and it's something I've done a lot of work on, Tregs and, and vaccination. And what we think in, um, happens in COVID is you get a very good um, early response with the adaptive immunity, but later you get quite a suppressed one, particularly in terms of the T cell response. Um, but you do need those neutralizing antibodies, and that will come up when I talk about the vaccines. So in terms of where we're at, it's been an absolutely horrendous year. We always knew that the world would and could face a pandemic, and we still have that threat um, among us. It could happen any time again with a new flu, for example. Um, but we've had almost 72 million recorded cases so far and over 1.6 million deaths. Now, that's what we know of, and they're the recorded ones. But just imagine how many asymptomatic cases and deaths that really have not been attributed to COVID. So an absolutely horrendous situation. At the moment, there are 212 COVID vaccines in development. Now, that is truly extraordinary when you look back to this time last year and we didn't even really know this virus was a problem. This has never happened in the world of vaccinology and will never possibly happen in my lifetime again. So for someone like me, this is just unbelievable what's happened. And 48 of those have reached clinical trials. So again, a really nice graphic here to try and explain the different approaches that are being taken to develop SARS-CoV-2 vaccines. On the left-hand side, we've got the conventional approaches. So at the top, we've got protein and peptide subunit vaccines. And essentially what you do is you take bits of that virus. So you can see there, there's bits of spike protein, bits of nuclear protein, whatever. 
and you mix it up with an adjuvant, inject it, and that causes an immune response. And you need that adjuvant to give all the extra stimuli and extra cytokines to actually make those proteins work. Because if you just put the proteins in there, they just get broken down and disappear. Underneath that, you've got virus-like particles. So those little particles look like the virus, but they're not live, and they're not the virus, and they don't cause disease, but they can stimulate an immune response. And then underneath, you've got the old traditional methods of either taking a whole virus and just attenuating it, so that's your old live vaccines, rather like MMR and yellow fever vaccine, they're live vaccines, or inactivated virus, where the virus has been treated in a certain way so it doesn't um, actually cause an immune, um, cause a, an infection, but causes an immune response. And with those inactivated ones, again, you need an adjuvant for them to actually work. But what's really interesting and exciting in this field is the right-hand side. And these are the novel approaches. So none of these have yet been licensed approaches that have been used in human vaccines. So at the top, you've got your nucleic acid vaccines. And either the DNA is used or mRNA. And I think everyone suddenly knows what an RNA vaccine is now with the news from Pfizer. But I will talk you through it a little bit more. Um, and then below that, viral vector vaccines. So these are vaccines that use a different virus carrying the nuclear material to infect cells, not cause disease, um, but actually cause the production of that spike protein or whatever target prote protein there is. And they can either be non-replicating viral vectors, so they go in and they don't replicate, but some of them are actually replicating viral vectors. So I'm going to now, just talk you through how the pipeline works for vaccine development. So, obviously, you begin with preclinical trials. These are animal studies, toxicology studies, trying to understand what your product is, and often end up doing getting animal models where you can actually challenge the animals. So, often in this case with SARS CoV 2, a lot of chimpanzee and macaque um, challenges have been done to see what protects those animals. And the good thing about those is you can actually take out different cells and see which ones are required for protection. Very recent data released only in the last few weeks is showing very clearly you need the neutralizing antibodies, but you also need the CD8 T cells and the CD4 T cells. You then go into phase one studies, and they're normally in less than 100 people, and they're safety studies to see is this safe in a human and immunogenic. So does it actually produce an immune response that you're looking for? And often these are also dose finding, where you're trying to try out different doses to actually see if it works. And they rapidly progress into phase two, usually in less than 1,000 people, further safety, further immunogenicity, and often further dose finding. We then enter phase three, and this is obviously the exciting phase because you know your vaccine's safe, seems to be, you know it's immunogenic, but now you want to see if it actually protects against your targeted disease. And in this case, for SARS-CoV-2, they're actually having to put tens of thousands of people into these trials. Now, many of um, vaccines in phase three are only tested in thousands. But um, it's for the, because of this disease and because of the amount of virus and the amount of people getting it, they're, they're using tens of thousands. And this is also to speed up the development. So um, a phase three trial could take several years. They are being done in a matter of months at the moment. And most of the trials are targeting 30, 40, 50,000 people, which is unprecedented for a phase three trial. Now, let's say those phase three trials show the vaccine is efficacious. We know that we're there right now. You then have to go and apply for approvals. So in Australia, that's obviously to the TGA. And I'm working very closely with the TGA with the work that I'm doing. And they're giving us regular updates about what they're doing. And we're sharing a lot of the safety and immunogenicity data. And uh, you can either go for provisional registration or full registration. And for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccines, it will be provisional or emergency use authorization, as they're doing in America at the moment, until we get more phase three data. But huge numbers of people have gone in these trials. And then afterwards, we go into phase four. And that is where the, tri the vaccines have been rolled out, they're being given to the public, and you start looking for other safety signals, because we have to be looking constantly to see if anything new happens. 
So here this slide just summarizes all of those different vaccines that are either in preclinical trials or clinical trials. And I guess the thing to point out, of course, is the multiple platforms being used. And I didn't even mention CD8 T cells because that's a bit complicated and I don't think we need to discuss that in this talk. But what you can see is that the protein and peptide subunit vaccines are the most popular. So 55 preclinical and 15 in clinical trials. But all the other ones as well, inactivated, the DNA, the RNA in particular, 22 preclinical, they're all coming through as pretty popular approaches. So we're going right across all the platforms with these um, approaches. The only one that hasn't got many is the live attenuated virus. And the reason for that is it's very hard and takes a long time and multiple passages in culture to be sure that you've got a truly attenuated virus. And if you haven't and it becomes wild type, you're going to cause um, COVID in your patients. So the Chinese are doing this. They've got three different studies making attenuated live viral vaccines. They're very immunogenic. They're very, very good, but they're probably going to take a lot longer. So none of those have got in clinical trials. So just to talk you through in a little bit more detail what those different vaccines are. So these are the inactivated whole virus vaccines or the live vaccines. As you can see at the top, you've either got a weakened virus, as I said, or an inactivated virus. And this is methodology that we have traditionally used going all the way back to the smallpox vaccine, which was a live attenuated vaccine. The thing about these, the live ones, is you can't use them in pregnant women, you can't use them in immunocompromised people, so there are certain contraindications and they're quite reactogenic. But on the whole, the inactivated ones are the ones that are more popular. There are seven of them are in clinical trials mostly adjuvanted using alum, which is the old adjuvant that we've got absolutely buckets of experience with in the vaccine world. Then we've got the protein peptide vaccines I mentioned. So they're bits of the VAC virus. They are mixed up with an adjuvant. And when they're injected, they get picked up by what's called antigen presenting cells and they process it and they start um, causing an immune response by stimulating that innate immunity and then that adaptive immune response with the B cells and the T cells. But what's critical here is the protein has to be in the right form because if it isn't in the right form, you get non-neutralizing antibodies and they can actually cause enhanced disease. And that's been shown in animal models of SARS and MERS. And there's a cat feline peritoneal virus, which is a coronavirus, and they made a vaccine and it caused enhanced disease when they actually gave the virus to those cats. And therefore, we've got to really watch for this in our human studies, and there's a lot of emphasis on that at the moment. The other thing is it always needs an adjuvant. So if we go to thinking about the confirmation, um, there's different approaches have been taken to hold that protein in, in, um, in its right confirmation. And the picture I've got here is um, this thing called the molecular clamp, where it clamps it into the, um, into the right conformation. Now, I've been giving this talk or talking about this for a little while, but it's extremely sad that this is the UQ vaccine that was withdrawn last week and isn't going to progress. And that is really sad because those group, they have worked so hard this year, and it was a brilliant idea, but they used a piece of HIV antigen to clamp it, and it caused false positive HIV results right across the board. I actually knew this, these data a couple of months ago, and I was of the opinion this was a non-starter. If you're going to get false positive HIV results, it doesn't cause HIV, it's just got a piece of the antigen in there. So very unlucky. But there's other people using different technologies. You also can use special packaging to make little particles, which are better, um, better uh, at stimulating an immune response. And the other thing that are being used in these, these vaccines is lots of novel adjuvants, ones that we've never used before in humans. So they're being tested over many years in different trials. They look to be very safe, but they're very good and probably better than alum, actually. Then we've got the viral vector vaccines. You've probably all heard about the Oxford vaccine. That's based on a chimpanzee adenovirus. And in fact, funnily enough, I guess this is where a lot of my experience came from. I started 20 years ago doing a PhD with the Oxford vaccine group that actually made that vaccine. And I worked on chimpanzee adenoviral vaccines in Africa before I came to Launceston. So I'm very familiar with this technology, very good way of stimulating an immune response. And as I say, you actually have a virus that goes in and infects the cell, but then starts to make the protein that you've put in there. So they're genetically modified viruses. 
They're a little hard to scale up the production, but as you probably or may not know, CSL in Melbourne is now already making the Oxford vaccine in millions of doses ready for rollout next year. Um, and they've learnt, got all the technology and the recipes. So the initial via, uh, vaccine will come in from abroad, but it will be made in Melbourne going forward. Um, and as a result of UQ vaccine being withdrawn in the last week, um, the government has now committed to another 20 million doses of that vaccine to be made. The nice thing about this technology is it can also be used for oral vaccines and for intranasal vaccines. So imagine if you just have to take a tablet. I mean, how amazing would that be if, you know, going forward? And that may come. There are some good vaccines that are doing this. So RNA vaccines are the ones that we're all hearing about. The Pfizer vaccine is an RNA vaccine. So what RNA is, when you have a DNA and you've got to make proteins from your DNA, which is what is the building blocks of human life, you make RNA. And RNA is, is the messenger, which then goes on to build those proteins. Now, what this does is it bypasses that. The RNA gets packaged up in little bits of lipid. So you just coat it in little lipid um, things. When it hits the cell, the RNA can enter the cell. Now, if you use naked RNA, it would um, just degrade immediately, gets into the cell, and just starts, the, the proteins start being built off that RNA. And there's also ones that are self-replicating, that get into the cell. They're called self-replicating RNA vaccines. Now, the ones that are licensed are not, but you can imagine they'll be even more immunogenic and more long-lasting because they keep making it. And you get your immune response. And finally, the DNA vaccines. So these are actually DNA rather than RNA. And I think the only concern people have with these is that perhaps they could integrate into the host DNA, although it's never been shown before, but it's always a considered risk. Nevertheless, they do the same thing. They go into the cell, they then convert the DNA into RNA, and they go on to make the protein. But with these, they often require a special administration system. And what you can see in the corner there is the Inovio electroporation device. And that is a thing that you inject and you sort of push it onto the arm and it opens pores in the cells um, and allows the DNA to enter. And you often need to do that to get the DNA in. And often they're used with naked DNA because it isn't broken down so well, but sometimes it's um, packaged as well. Um, so in Australia, I just thought I'd tell you what trials are happening here. There's been five different vaccines that are all being tested right now in Australia with a lot of my colleagues. We've got the Flinders University vaccine, which is a protein vaccine. We had the University of Queensland vaccine, the spike clamp one that I talked about. Novavax is another one we're very interested in. It's now in phase three, and that's the spike protein again with a special adjuvant called Matrix M. Then we've got another protein made by someone called Clover, and um, that's the trials are ongoing in Perth. And finally, this virus-like particle, which has got what's called a spy tag superglue, and they've actually glued the spike protein to it using this novel technology. So it's just incredible, this interesting technology. But the really sad thing is the UQ vaccine. I really feel for those guys. I know a lot of them quite well, and um, you know we were so hopeful. That was our front-runner Australian vaccine, but that's a goner. And I think this is what you have to realize. 200 plus vaccines in trials, 5% generally make it when they go through clinical trials. But that does mean for us, we should get about 10 vaccines that work. But you never know which one's going to come through and be the best vaccine in the end. But I have to say, it's going to be hard to beat a 95% efficacious RNA vaccine, to be honest. I mean, we never expected it to be so good. So phase one and phase two trials, they've started to publish. An awful lot of those people have not published any phase one and phase two data, but I've just listed those that have. Three of the viral vector vaccines, three of the mRNA vaccines, one of the whole inactivated vaccines, and one, um, in fact, there's two now, just this week, last couple of weeks, one of them, in fact, last week, I think, one of them, another protein vaccine has also published data. So this is a really busy slide, but the reason I'm showing it was this is from a paper that I wrote, and I was summarizing the um, different um, reactogenicity um, readouts for these vaccines, just to give an idea of how they compare, because I think it's important to understand which ones cause more reactions than others, because we need to prepare the public for it. 
And don't, you don't need to read it all, but if you look at the different types of things that we're looking at, and then you look at those RNA vaccines, the two RNA vaccines, you can see they're very reactogenic. 100% in those bottom ones are getting pain, fatigue, headache, so quite reactogenic vaccines. Then you compare with the inactivated whole virus with alum, almost no reactogenicity. So these are important considerations when you're trying to think who should get what vaccine and also how well they're going to be tolerated. Um, and if you look at the top and the bottom, we've got the um, adenoviral, viral vectored ones. They're sort of in between the mRNA and the inactivated. And at the bottom, the protein vaccines as well. But we expect vaccines to cause some pain and a bit of headache, fever, aching muscles. But some of these, they can be um, continue for a little while. And so we just need to be prepared for that, really. In terms of immunogenicity, Every single one that has released phase one results is showing that they're pretty immunogenic and they're producing neutralizing antibodies to the same level as somebody who's actually recovered from virus, viral infection. And so this is called convalescence serum and they compare it to that and they're getting equivalent responses. One of the problems with this, though, is there's no standardized neutralizing antibody assay in the entire world. And so basically, every lab is doing their own thing. They're reporting different units and measure, and it's absolutely impossible at the moment to compare these vaccines. So that's a piece of work I'm hoping to do next year, as soon as they're rolled out and start comparing back to back the vaccines. And the other problem as well with those viral vectors is if you have seen adenovirus in your lifetime, which most people have, those antibodies that you produce will actually prevent the vaccine from working as well. And that's been shown in the adenovirus 5 studies, and I'm sure will come play out in some of the other studies as well. And that's why the Russians were very clever, and they used two different adenoviruses, an adenovirus 5 followed by an adenovirus 26. And I thought that was pretty smart of them because they've overcome that problem, um, whereas the others haven't. And Oxford are using a chimpanzee adenovirus to avoid that problem as well, because we don't generally have immunity to chimpanzee viruses. T cells, they've looked at T cell responses and they have found that we're getting CD8 and CD4 T cells, although I must say that nearly all of it's based on CD4s. Very little, a few of the vaccines are producing CD8 responses. And we do need to be Th1 immune. Now, this is all a bit complicated for non-immunologists, but if you're two Th2, that's the thing that's associated with allergy and asthma and can actually cause an adverse reaction, can make you get very wheezy, cause lots of eosinophils in the lungs, and we're trying to avoid that. That's something that we've seen with other vaccines historically. So this is the really exciting stuff. 11 candidates in phase three trials, and I just am thrilled that this is happening so fast. It's just wonderful. And what you can see is we've got um, four of non-replicating viral vectors, four inactivated vaccines, two RNA vaccines, and one protein vaccine have all got through to their efficacy studies. And we just would never have guessed it could happen so quick. They're all given intramuscularly. They're all based on the spike protein. And we've got generally two doses required, although occasionally one dose is required. And you can just see that list there. And I guess this is my most exciting slide of the day. It doesn't look very pretty, but it is exciting anyway to me. At the top, we've got the data from the phase three trial results that Peter was alluding to at the beginning. And for that Pfizer vaccine, 43,000 people got the vaccine, two doses. It says four weeks apart, but actually, sorry, that's three weeks apart. That's an error. 95% efficacy against symptomatic disease seven days after dose two. That is extraordinary. We were thinking, well, we might be lucky if we get 50%. What if we even get 60%? You've got to think flu vaccine. We've been making them for years. Only 50% efficacious. And in the older people, sometimes only as low as 30% efficacy. So this is just truly extraordinary. Even people over 65 who don't normally respond as well to vaccines, 94% efficacy. There was consistent protection across race, ethnicity, gender, and um, only one severe case in a vaccine recipient, although that piece of information does concern me a little. I'd like to see no severe cases. I'd like this vaccine to prevent people ending up on ICU and dying. But what's really exciting is that um, it's been rolled out last week in the UK. So that is just unbelievable that the first people have got it and America are about to do the same thing. 
the FDA have granted an emergency use authorization and um, it will get full approvals in the coming days and will start going out to healthcare workers. They're planning to make 50 million doses this year and 1.3 billion next year. Um, and the one caveat with this vaccine is it requires minus, minus 70 degrees storage and this is an issue even for Australia um, to actually get these vaccines out because they're all coming apparently in pizza boxes all in minus 70 and you have to thaw them and use them really quickly and so this is a major issue. But it will last five days in the fridge and we've only just found out these data. Underneath, we've got the Moderna vaccine. Now, we won't be getting that in Australia, but that, um, there's a number of companies have, have, uh, countries have shown an interest in that one. Very similar, mRNA vaccine. This company has never made a successful medicinal product, and suddenly they're making the COVID vaccine. I mean, it's quite amazing, really, that that's happened. 30,000 people tested in their trials, 94.5% efficacy. So these mRNA vaccines are amazing, and we'll be able to use these for future diseases and threats. And no severe disease in the vaccinated groups. That's 100% protection against severe disease. 37% of the people from racial and ethnic minorities. And the reason I'm pointing that out is because we've got to worry about the high risk groups. Who are the people that are more likely to die? We know it's the older people, but also a lot of racial or ethnic minorities. We think that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders would be if they hadn't been so well protected in Australia like they were. Um, and so this is something that's very important to us if we're trying to prioritize who gets the vaccine. And um, the FDA will be meeting next week to, to decide on this one, but I can guarantee in two weeks' time that will be being rolled out as well. And the good thing about that one is it lasts 30 days in the fridge, so a little bit more easy to deliver. Then we've got the Oxford one that I've men mentioned, the chimpanzee adenovirus being developed by AstraZeneca. Um, and this, the results are very confusing. Now, they released their actual efficacy data last week in The Lancet, and I've been trawling through the paper over the last few days. Um, and in Brazil, 10,000 people, two doses, naught and four weeks apart, 62% efficacy. In England, 12,000 people, 90% um, efficacy. So very confusing. However, what happened was they had a half or a low dose with the first dose and they didn't realize because they were using a different method to determine how much virus was in there. And then they used a quantitative method to actually determine the amount of virus and discovered it was much lower than they were expecting. And so consequently, it looks like a half dose followed by a full dose is a better um, thing. But unfortunately, they've now got to do all the trials to actually prove that. And that's back to the drawing board and another 20,000 odd people. And this is the nature of the beast with these vaccine trials. It's really tricky. But at least we've still got a vaccine that is giving high efficacy and no hospitalizations, no severe disease. And we're likely to have a lot of doses of these um, in Australia. So they are also going to make 3 billion doses next year, which is unbelievable. And then at the bottom, I put the Sputnik V. So this is the Russian vaccine, adenovirus 26 and adenovirus 5 vaccine. They say it's 92% efficacious, but unfortunately, there's no data, nothing released. They haven't told us what their measure of efficacy is, so nobody actually knows, and they're rolling it out in millions of people in Russia, so, and they're not planning to share it. So it's, it's kind of interesting what's happening there, but I think they really felt they had to be um, up there with the Americans and the Europeans and other people making the vaccine, and, and I, I believe it will be a good vaccine. It would just be nice to sort of see the data. So nobody's really, at the moment, able to really judge that vaccine. But this is just so amazing to be able to see the first two people last week in the UK getting the RNA vaccine. So down in the bottom is the first woman to ever get the vaccine, the first person. And next to her, and the UK made a huge thing about this, is William Shakespeare. And he is an old chap called William Shakespeare and he was the second person and the first man. And then they said, well, she's 1A, then he's 2B. And they said, 2B or not 2B. And I've been reading all the stuff in the paper and they have made such a big deal and so many puns on William Shakespeare. But in any way, but they, as I said before, this virus has got the RNA and causes you to make the protein. And 8th of December, the first doses, 
USA was due to start vaccinating today, but I don't think the FDA have quite granted that approval, but it's about to happen. And you probably would have realized there were two cases of anaphylaxis um, in the first day, actually, of vaccination. Now, that's normally a one in a million event, so a bit concerning. Very reactogenic vaccine, so they're really having to look at people who do have a very severe allergy profile. Now, you know, we, you don't really want having anaphylaxis to vaccines, and you certainly need to make sure that you've got the right equipment to prevent that. But I should just warn you, these are interim results on the whole. We don't know how long protection lasts. We don't know how long it takes for immunity to wane. And most of the priority populations that we're really concerned about are highly underrepresented. The very much older people, immunocompromised people, pregnant women aren't included in any studies whatsoever. Um, and we don't know whether these affect disease transmission. So they may prevent you getting ill, but do they stop you getting it and then passing it to other people? And we don't know that yet. So there's a lot of caveats at the moment, but we're still very excited by the data. So that's all the information at the moment, and I'm just going to talk about a couple of things just to give you a bit of a picture of the international um, response to this, because I think it's just so fascinating. So the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations, or CEPI, was um, set up three years ago by a very smart immunologist and vaccinologist from the States who said, what about if we have disease X hit us one day? We need to prepare for that. And they started preparing very clever because they had all these groups mobilized to start thinking, what would you do if disease X comes along? Well, this year it did. We suddenly get COVID. They didn't know what it was going to be, but a lot of people were already up and running and the money was being raised. And this is a not-for-profit organization. It's hosted out of Norway, but a lot of people involved. And they have a scientific committee who are trying to decide on vaccines. And they have been working since this all happened, with all global health authorities and vaccine developers to try and advance some of the front-runner candidates. And they have advanced and been supporting nine. Now, one of them was the UQ vaccine, so that one is now out. And this is, they know that they're going to lose some, but they've put a lot of money into this. Um, and they work right from discovery, right through to delivery and stockpiling. And they right up front said, we've got to have global access because it's all very well if Australia's protected, but every time someone new comes in, it brings in a risk because there's always going to be people who don't get the vaccine, whose immunity has waned, etc. We need the whole world to be protected. Then there's the brilliant COVAX facility. So this is co-led by Gavi, so the Global Alliance on Vaccines, CEPI and the WHO. And this is where they've got a global risk sharing initiative, which I think is just amazing. What they're doing is they're asking rich countries to put money in. They will then guarantee that that country gets a certain amount of vaccines for a proportion of their population, but then they ask that you also give some money to support poorer countries that can't afford the vaccines. And Australia has made a very generous amount of, um, put a generous amount of money into this, um, and uh, they also have guaranteed that they will also get some of those vaccines from the COVAX facility. Now, they're only aiming to make get um, 2 billion doses next year, by the end of next year, but you've got to remember there are 7.7 .7 billion people in the world, and if it's 2 billion doses, it's only 1 billion courses of vaccines if you need to. So it's still only about 12% of the population that can be covered through this facility. But then again, a lot of countries are also setting up their own deals. But, you know, we really do want to avoid this whole concept of vaccine nationalism where you only protect your people. And it's so important to protect everybody around the world. Um, the other thing I thought I'd mention was Operation Warp Speed. This is what the Americans set up, and their plan is to have 300 million doses um, by the early 2021. And they've been supporting a number of vaccine initiatives. And the last one is the World Health Organization's Strategic Advisory Group of Experts. So the SAGE group always advises WHO on vaccines and vaccine programming. And they've been looking at policy advice, guidance on model modeling, on which are the target populations. And my group has been using the SAGE information to try and, try and decide who the priority populations for Australia are. And one of the people on that SAGE working group is on my group as well. So out of the work that we've been doing, um, we've, uh, the COVID-19 vaccination policy has come out and has been published. Um, and there are many groups in government working on this, from National Cabin Cabinet to the TGA, our group at Targi, the Advisory Committee on Vaccines. So it's a big effort. 
And there's three main groups within a target. One is the vaccine utilization and prioritization group, which is my group. Then we've got distribution and program implementation to work out the logistics. And then safety evaluation, monitoring, and vaccine confidence, which obviously is really important. And this is the Australian commitment to COVID vaccines. So basically, these are the ones that they have shown an interest in and were committed to actually roll out in Australia. And at the top, we've got the AstraZeneca chimp adenovirus vaccine. And they have pre-purchased 53.8 million doses of that vaccine. Now, bearing in mind there's 25, 24 million people in Australia, that's enough to vaccinate the whole of the Australian population. And they're hoping to get them all by the end of next year. Um, and that's gone up by 20 million since yesterday because of the fact that the UQ vaccine has been withdrawn. Then we've got the Janssen vaccine. Now, that has got a preliminary de provisional determination with the TGA. And what that means is that they're allowed to start submitting data to actually apply for a preliminary approval. So the Oxford vaccine as well has got a preliminary determination and so has the Pfizer mRNA vaccine. So all three of them have submitted their original data to the TGA and they're undergoing constant and rolling review. And the moment they have got enough data, they will be able to get a provisional licensing of that vaccine. So this is very important to Australia and this is what we're waiting for. We actually don't know as a group when it's coming, but we've got to decide who gets it as soon as it's available. So 10 million doses only of the Pfizer vaccine, that's only enough to immunise 5 million people. So not many of those, but a fantastic vaccine. We then got the Novavax vaccine that hasn't released phase three data yet, but um, 51 million doses were committed. And the UQ vaccine, they had committed to 51 million, that one's out. So we're down to these four. But as I said, Australia has also has invested in the COVAX facility. Determining the priority populations, this has been something I've spent weeks and weeks thinking about, and uh, you know we have to do this because we won't have enough vaccine nor the logistics to deliver it to everyone straight up. But let's face it, we are in the most extraordinary situation. You look at the UK, look at Europe, look at USA, they are in an absolutely terrible situation with people dying everywhere of COVID. We're not. So we actually have the luxury to be able to think about this logistically. And in fact, probably our ports of entry are our greatest risk. Um, but we've got to think about the local epidemiology. We've been using some of the SAGE data and some of the stuff that's come out of the United States to try and help us, guide us on, on our roadmap to how we're going to determine who's a priority. And this is um, a document published by my group, which is the preliminary advice to the government on who we think will need to get the vaccine and the rationale for that. But a lot of it also has to put in mind equity and fairness as well in terms of distribution, because certain populations can't always get the vaccine. And these are the three main sort of priority groups. Those at increased risk of developing severe disease or dying, those at increased risk of exposure or onward transmission, and those working in services critical to societal functioning. And um, we're just trying to really map those out right now in detail. Um, and that's the meeting I just came from. And there's a whole load of factors you've got to bear in mind here. Who does the vaccine work in? What's the composition? What's the storage requirements? How does it actually work in the body? Which populations can't get it? How reactogenic is it? Um, how, long, how often do you need a booster? So all of these things, we don't know a lot of this at the moment, so we're kind of working in the dark. It's a, it's a logistic nightmare, really, trying to think it out. And of course, different epidemiological scenarios require different ways of doing things. And we're very lucky to be on the right-hand side where our greatest risk is that little red aeroplane coming in that's going to bring the disease into this country. But otherwise, we don't really have much spread at all. As of last week, there were only 50 cases, active cases in the whole of Australia. I mean, unbelievable, really, how well we've done. And we do know that different jurisdictions may be in different epidemiological situations. I'm almost done. <laughs> vaccine safety monitoring, absolutely critical. We do know that. Um, these vaccines have been developed at pandemic speed. There's a lot of concern um, by the people that, that you know, they, they've been developed too fast and are they actually safe? 
And you do miss rare safety signals um, when you do these kind of trials quickly, but you also do, in many phase three trials, don't get the rare safety signals. So they will be very carefully watched for. And we know many populations haven't even been included. Pregnant women, some of the very old people, children, the children's studies are only just starting and, and severely immunocompromised people. So we've really got to look out for adverse events, but again, CEPI comes in with WHO and the Brighton collaboration, and they've developed a huge list of adverse events of special interest, um, and there will be very enhanced monitoring. I can tell you that in Tasmania, I've been meeting with the adverse event monitoring people, and there's probably going to be daily follow-up of people when they get their vaccines here. So it'll be really important to ensure that the public are confident with the vaccines. So just to finish, we now have several immunogenic COVID-19 vaccines with acceptable safety profiles and incredible e efficacy. All three of those efficacious vaccines that we've got are using platforms we've never licensed for human use before. We have a bit of time and a bit of luxury to watch what happens while they're being rolled out elsewhere to millions of people. We are going to learn a lot in the next three months. Um, and we plan in Australia to start vaccinating in March next year. Um, and that will be a federally co coordinated plan which will be delivering the vaccines to the jurisdictions. We know the first generation vaccines won't be perfect. We will definitely see them improved as time goes on. We know which the target populations are, but we still have a lot of unknowns to actually figure out what we're doing. So thank you. I will leave it there and I'm um, very happy to take any questions. Wonderful, Katie. That was just fantastic. Thank you very much. So we've got some roving mics here um, around the room. If you would like to ask a question, put your hands in the air. Um, Beck has got one here. Thank you so much for the presentation, absolutely wonderful. Notwithstanding the development in the platforms, how confident were you earlier on in the year that uh, vaccines would be arrived at? And how has that changed for you personally throughout 2020? Well, it's interesting because quite early on in the piece, I was asked to do a podcast which is um, called Road to a COVID-19 Vaccine, and I was asked when I thought we would have one, and I predicted by December this year. I just know the determination, the, pl the money was there, and what's so amazing is, you know, the, 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 everything's been done in parallel for this, so it's never happened like this before. I started working on malaria vaccines in the 90s. And everyone said, yeah, 10 years we'll have a malaria vaccine. Well, the one that I worked on, it was 23 years before it actually gets, um, got um, licensed. And so, you know, that's the speed of things normally. We're talking 10, 15, 20 years. So, but I, I really did believe this was going to happen. I think the world knew that we were in serious trouble here. And, um, you know, when you're seeing over 200 candidates being developed, you know that there's some serious action in place and the money's there and the political will's been there. It's been a truly extraordinary journey for me this year to be very involved with this on a national but also an international scale as well with a lot of the work I've been doing and, you know, it's just, I'm almost speechless that we're there already and that last week the vaccines were happening. It makes me quite emotional actually. Katie told me a few months ago um, it's very rare that a vaccine's ever found. And I said to her, don't tell me that. <laughs> and we're right in the midst of this thing, so there we go. Um, I should just say, put your hand up if you want to ask a, uh, ask a question. Beck or Rocky will come. Um, please don't grab hold of the microphone, though. Um, that's a COVID safety rule. So, um, Rocky, you've got a question here. Oh. Don't grab it. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, well. That's a good, that's a good start. <laughs> Katie, you know, this week I went to, or didn't go to, we had by Zoom the uh, annual meeting of the Cardiac Society of Australia and uh, they looked at the flu vaccine and uh, its efficacy um, and mentioned topics that, uh, aspects of it that I'm sure you're familiar with, I wasn't. But one thing that surprised me and I always prick my ears up when they talk about the elderly population because, you know, I'm not, not that old but I'm getting a bit older. Uh, but anyway, the, the, the issue is why do the elderly get so crook when they get flu? And uh, I thought, well, it's an additive thing. You know, they've, they've got uh, already, they're in heart failure and then they get a bad respiratory problem and they get crook as a result. I wasn't aware that the flu vaccine, the, the flu virus, 
actually attacked the cardiovascular system. Yeah. And they increased the risk of stroke and heart attack and heart failure. Uh, and moreover, one of the, the speakers suggested that there was some evidence, perhaps, that even when those things are inactive in the older population, the flu vaccine may improve prognosis, which I thought was tremendously exciting. Yes. Now, are you looking at a similar sort of scenario with the coronavirus? Okay, so that goes to speaks to non-specific effects of vaccines, which I've spent years working on in all sorts of contexts. And certain vaccines can do things to your body, to your immune system, that are nothing to do with vaccine-induced immunity, but can affect you in either beneficial ways or harmful ways. And you're quite right, the flu vaccine has a big cardiovascular protective effect, and it's not about preventing flu 100%. It's actually the vaccine, intrinsic characteristics of the vaccine, that actually do that. Now, I think it would be great to do some work on those effects, and I'm right now, I'm gonna take a week of study leave next week to actually write some um, vaccine studies and carry on doing some of this non-specific effects because that's something I work on. I, I do a thing called systems vaccinology where we look at the whole immune system, everything that happens when a vaccine is given using all sorts of interesting technology. And I'm doing that for flu vaccine in the elderly in Tasmania at the moment. And I'm planning on doing it for COVID vaccines because I, I think it will be very nice to use the technologies and all the mechanisms we've got set up as soon as the vaccines are rolled out in Tasmania. So I'm going to be tapping up Peter actually to, to, with a new um, application to the Clifford Craig for that. And in fact, specifically want to take this opportunity because there's no information about these vaccines. Vic, over your way. Yeah, hi. Um, I'm interested in the how you go about, um, you talked about the risk uh, immunosuppressed group. At which point do you start the trials with that group so that, you know, you say they need to get it first, but there's not been much um, trialling of that. Yeah, so the trials do need to be done, but I guess because of the speed at which everything's being done, they've, they've been excluding a lot of those immunosuppressed people. Having said that, they have included people on some of the biologic agents. They have included some people with rheumatoid arthritis and other um, auto-inflammatory diseases and things, but generally fairly stable people. So those trials need to be targeted to do safety and immunogenicity in those. And the same with pregnant women. They need to be done. And in fact, I've been pushing quite hard to get some pregnancy studies up and running in Australia because I think you've got to do that. But the other thing is that you can think about the theoretical risk. Now, these are vaccines that are not live attenuated vaccines. So theoretically, should be perfectly safe to give. But what we wouldn't think is they won't give such good immunogenicity. Um, the other thing is that some immunosuppressed people in those tens of thousands of people that have got into trials will be, um, will be getting uh, the vaccine, same as pregnant women. I mean, they know that in Brazil, a lot of women that didn't think they were pregnant turned out to be pregnant when they actually got into the, into the trial. And so uh, those things are happening. It's just that the numbers are small. But it, it makes it difficult to then set priorities. But for example, um, you know, with the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders, we don't even have good data to prove that they're more susceptible, but we would theoretically expect that. But they were brilliantly cocooned during um, the COVID situation that happened here because of a very, very rapid and comprehensive um, program across Australia to protect them because many died of flu and have died of flu. Mm. At the back of the room, Rochelle. Uh, thank you, Katie, for that excellent overview. Uh, Edwin, obstetrician at Los Um Are we going to be assuming that uh, everybody's going to respond, or is there going to be a test after the jab to see who has zero converted, whether he needs a third jab uh, before you can uh, say he, the person is protected? We don't think, and I don't think anyone in the world thinks that there's logistically going to be, you're going to be able to test everyone to see if they've actually had a response. So I think the vaccines around the world will start to speak for themselves. All of the phase one, two data is showing that after two shots of the vaccine, everybody makes neutralizing antibodies. Now, the other thing is, as I was telling you, there isn't any standardized neutralizing antibody test across the whole of Australia at the moment, and we don't have a correlative protection. So we don't know what would be your correlative protection in a human. 
And that's fine. You can, we don't know correlates of protection for many of the vaccines that we use, but there wouldn't really be a test that we could do to be absolutely sure. But we do know that in certain populations it won't work as well, and some of the vaccines are not working as well in the elderly. They're just slightly less immunogenic. And we would anticipate in, in an immunocompromised person that they probably won't respond as well to vaccine. And as things develop and get further nuanced, we may recommend a third dose, for example, in an immunocompromised person, rather like we recommend repeat dosing with pneumococcal vaccine for people with HIV and immunocompromised. So I think the program will slowly develop and we'll get to understand more and more about these vaccines. And sort of going back to your question, all the data will start to emerge from those different higher risk populations. But at the moment, we don't have that luxury. And I think we've just got to make best guesses, really, in terms of getting in there and vaccinating people that are more at risk. Over here, Paul. Uh, thanks for the talk, um, Katie. Just uh, one question. Given the fact that um, countries in other parts of the world are going to be rolling out their programs a lot sooner than in Australia, that's obviously going to be beneficial for us in regards to the learnings we can take for that. What kind of impact do you think that will have in regards to the timing of the rollout of our programs and how we might be able to more effectively roll out programs? Yeah, look, I don't think we'll roll out before the beginning of March, and the reason for that is the TGA reviews are, are happening at the moment. Um, as I said, I've had a number of conversations with them, and, and it's quite clear that there's still a lot of data that we need to go through to really understand those vaccines. And if you look at that AstraZeneca vaccine, We've got two very different efficacies in different populations, and their subgroups were all a little bit confused in the different trials, and they're all a bit different, and so we've got to really understand those data. So Australia is absolutely sticking to that timeline of the 1st of March, and I think that's a fairly realistic and sensible one. And also, when the vaccine comes in, and when we've first of all got to get them registered, but then we've got to get the vaccine here, and at the moment, all the logistics to deliver is being set up, who does it, where do, is it going to be done, all the immunisation committees in the jurisdictions are being mobilised, the workforce is being mobilised, we've got a whole subgroup working on all of the, all, all of the distribution side of things. So I, th I think it will happen then, um, at the beginning of March, and I don't see that there's a huge urgency to do it any quicker. I know that in the press they're sort of saying, oh, maybe we should be doing it immediately, but actually, no. I think it's great that we've got this time, because there's probably going to be another... 10 million people immunised by the time we roll out. Well, that's like fantastic. You'd never get phase three data like that before rolling out a vaccine. So I think we're very fortunate. And um, we will be watching very, very closely everything that happens in the world to make sure that we get it right. And that if there's any signals of something being worrying somewhere, we'll have that information. It'd be wonderful. Uh, James. Thank you for your presentation, it was fantastic. I've just got a question in relation to cold chain. It's difficult enough maintaining the, it's challenging enough maintaining the cold chain at normal temperatures. Could you go into a bit more detail in relation to maintaining it at minus 70? Yeah, so that's really tricky and um, is, is a logistic nightmare, really, from a point of view of these vaccines. So for the Pfizer vaccine, they've got these special minus 70 with dry ice kind of packaging type things, which are all monitored. I mean, all vaccine cold chain has to be done with really close and, and reliable monitoring. So it'll come with little monitors with it. You'll be able to know, you put your thing in, you monitor in a computer, it will spit out... It, what the temperature was the, in the whole life of that vaccine's journey. So that's all going to be really important pieces of work. The government are currently trying to figure out where they're going to store all these vaccines in minus 70s around the country. There will be people, um, companies commissioned to provide some of those extra spaces that are needed. So that all that piece of logistic is being done. And then once that vaccine is, is actually made up with the normal saline, you've got... Um, really not long at all to actually use it in the matter of like five hours otherwise it has to be discarded we don't want to discard a single dose this year next year we want every single dose to be accounted for and we want every single dose used now that may not happen i have to tell you that we've discovered that millions of doses of flu vaccine this year are unaccounted for we don't know where they went we don't know who they went to but they just, um, it's going to be mandatory in the next few months to put all your COVID vaccines and flu vaccines into AIR, which is the adult immunisation record. So 
That will help with accountability. But this is a huge piece of work. It's causing a lot of people a headache. The way in which these are packaged, they come in huge pizza boxes all stacked, all wrapped up and all in the minus 80 sort of setting. So to get them all out and put them somewhere safe, it's going to be tricky, but uh, you know, I'll leave that to other people to figure out the logistics of that. Uh, down here with the lovely Christmas top on too. Thank you very much, I thoroughly enjoyed it. With the fact that we've got a vaccine coming, we'll have two groups of people, those who choose to have it and those that choose not to. Those that choose not to, how much of a risk are they going to put the population? Yeah, look, that's a very good question. And I think the whole issue of vaccine confidence and messaging, I think is so critical. So we have a whole group working on that. And the, the National Task Force is looking at the whole communication strategy. I think things could speed up. I'd like to see a bit more communication being out there. I'd like to start seeing TV ads coming up and actually really getting people across this space. I think we've got to get people confident. Uh, there will be an anti-vaccination community. You'll never change their minds on the whole. But there's the, all those hesitant people, and they're not anti-vac people. They are people who are genuinely concerned, and they want to know what they're doing is safe. And so I think that we've, we've really got to work hard to engage those people. Because if, you, if we do decide that we want to have widespread herd immunity, rather than protecting priority areas, so we can go into nursing homes and we can go to frontline healthcare staff and we can do our border protection staff and everything. But once you want to roll out across the whole country, you do need a significant number of people to be immunized to have herd immunity because we're not going to get it through natural infection. We're certainly not going to get it in Australia through natural infection. So, we do need very broad and widespread uptake. And that's also got to scale down to children as well, because although they're not a huge risk in terms of themselves and getting sick, they are still potentially um, people who can pass on the infection. Not hugely, actually, but um, those, those teenage sort of 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, they definitely do and contribute. So, um, really, we do need widespread immunisation across the country and we need really good uptake. And there's a lot of surveys going on around the world to try and understand confidence. And there's quite a lot of people who'd rather get COVID than have the vaccine. So, um, it's very interesting. So, I think if the public messaging is good and if it's done well and if it's done right, then I think we might get widespread coverage. But I am concerned and, um, you know... I just hope that we get that right and we get the message out there. But I think things like this are really important. I think people need to be out there talking to their public and I think people who know that have the knowledge should be out there talking now. And I've been really pushing hard for that to start happening. And that's one thing I feel very strongly about, actually. John, if I could just take up that point. I'm, I've mentioned this before, but um, I've mentioned this before, but in, in the... Um, case of polio, they've elicited rotary throughout the world and uh, it's been a hugely successful publicity campaign, if you like, uh, overcoming a lot of very big barriers to, to uh, reduce polio down to a, a minimum level as they've done. We could do the same with, uh, with this, I would think. Yeah, look, I'm sure rotary will get involved, actually. Um, and. Uh Probably, I don't know that they will in Australia because it's all being done federally, but certainly in, in, in the sort of poorer countries of the world, it will. I think this gentleman here has been waiting to ask a question for a while. Sorry, then we can go to the other one. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I've been truncated by a couple of questions, but what would constitute um, widespread immunity? Would it be 95% of the population or not? And Dr Norma Swan is keeping the public updated. He's of the opinion that Australia should not be um, going in head first, just to wait back, see what happens, and then just do it gradually. And he's encouraged the TGA to be you know, very slow and deliberate and just bring it through gradually. Yeah, look, so I think ideally we'd want around 70% of the population to be, to be immunised. I think, yeah, I, I've, I've had conversations with Norman Swan, and um, I... 
I think he's right. We don't want to, we don't have to rush. We, we're in a very luxurious position here. Having said that, look what happened in Victoria. That could happen anywhere at any time, and it just happens over weeks. Suddenly, massive outbreak. And, and so we, we need to be mindful of that. The other thing is, because we are not doing this right now, and all these other countries are, I, as I said, millions of doses will be given in the next few months around the world, and we will have all of those data. And because there are all, there's such fantastic joined up communication going on around the world between all the different immunization committees internationally, and Australia has a big strong link and plays a big part in those, that international collaboration, we'll, we'll just have all of that information. So I'm not worried because I know that's all coming as well. Having, and also that those vaccine platforms, there's no reason for them to be terribly unsafe, to be honest. Yes, reactogenic fevers, headaches, myalgia, feeling a bit lousy, but hey, if you get COVID, <laughs> you've got a like 3% chance of dying and, um, and, and a fairly reasonable chance of ending up in hospital as well. And, um, and then there's the whole story of long COVID, you know, where people are now developing these horrible long-term sequelae from having had a, had a COVID infection, which we don't even, can't even begin to understand at the moment. It concerns me that the whole of the Queensland project has just been thrown out. Is there not a way of getting rid of the HIV component and progressing that forward, or is it just a public um, a political security thing? Um, yes, yeah, so look, the group that are making that vaccine are deeply, deeply disappointed, of course. However, they've learnt a lot through what they've done, and they can repurpose their clamp and try and find another way, but it's going to take well over a year. So they are out of that whole race at the moment. They cannot progress with that molecular clamp, and it's not just a political thing. Actually, the HIV tests were positive on every single machine, including the ones we do as confirmatory tests. So what would happen is all these people could potentially be getting diagnosed with HIV, and what about if you travel and you end up having an HIV test for some reason and it comes positive and in another country they don't realise, or in Africa, trying to roll out a vaccine like that where you don't have all the sophisticated testing for HIV would be difficult. But it would have had to change all the HIV testing algorithms in Australia to actually have that vaccine deployed in this country. And I have to say, as soon as I found that out, I just thought this is a non-starter. And this is the problem, you know, vaccines don't get up because things happen along the way. Anything could happen with any of these vaccines. Something awful might happen with one of the RNA vaccines and that's it, shut down. Everyone says, no, nope, don't give it. You just don't know. I mean, but it shouldn't happen. I mean, we've been using vaccines throughout the world for years and years and years. And these technologies that are being used now are far safer than the old live vaccines. Uh, Professor, two questions which are linked. Uh, the first one is uh, with the Oxford vaccine. Uh, it's counterintuitive that um, a lower dose would give a better effect. Of course it is. So possibly could you speculate on the mechanism? Why is that? And it's outside the prevailing paradigm. So if we continue to think outside, why wouldn't you give um, the first dose with one vaccine and the second dose with another one? Okay, those are two brilliant questions from an immunology point of view, which is what I like doing. So I think there's two possible answers to the low dose, high dose, and why that was a more immunogenic and better vaccine um, schedule. When you prime the immune system, sometimes if you do too much, all the cells that get primed apoptose and die. And so you don't get such a great memory response and you don't get good memory B cells and T cells. So that's one possibility. The other is, when you get that first chimp adenovirus, you can make antibodies to it, anti-vector antibodies. And if you give more of the virus, then you're likely to make more antibodies. And we've asked the company for the data on the um, anti-vector antibodies, but we haven't been given it yet. So that's the answer to that question. And it's theoretical, but those are the two sort of prevailing views at the moment on what the, the mechanism might be. In terms of using one and then the other, Fantastic question. I've already written a grant proposal to do exactly that. So prime boosting with different ones and often using different vectors and different constructs 
gives a better immune response than if you use the same construct. And Oxford hi historically used to use DNA prime and uh, viral vector boosting. And a lot of the work that I did in Africa on malaria vaccines was using different prime boost strategies. And I heard actually yesterday that the trials are already about to start in the UK doing different prime boost schedules using different vaccines. But as I say, I wrote um, with another person a grant to carry out in Australia um, prime boost schedules of all sorts of different vaccine combinations, depending on what we could get our hands on. So it's a very good question. And it would be great if you didn't have to worry about which vaccine you'd have previously and you could boost with a second one, because we're going to have the problem of multiple vaccines around and who gets what, and then trying to logistically say, okay, so you got the RNA and we need another lot of RNA for you, but then you had a chimp adenovirus and then maybe you're gonna get a protein vaccine. So this, this is a headache for us and uh, <laughs> we're thinking about it a lot. So I'd like to be able to do priming and boosting. Um. The Australian vaccine, why couldn't people be afforded the choice of having that one if they wished? So if they wanted to um, and didn't mind if they got a false positive HIV result. I think that the government felt from a messaging point of view to try and explain to people what a false positive HIV test means and also then to logistically have across the whole country to change the algorithms for testing for, for that virus was just too high risk. And I personally, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time dealing with people with HIV and diagnosing people with HIV. And the complexities in somebody who's had an HIV vaccine and then I, sorry, had a, one of these vaccines, and then I think that they're at risk of HIV, and I know that even if I do all the tests, they're going to be positive regardless. So the only way I can diagnose it is by doing a molecular RNA test, which is not a diagnostic test for HIV. It's not meant to be used in that way. It's very tricky. And you, with acute HIV, the quicker you treat it, the better the outcomes in the long term. And so for me, I could see this was very, very problematic. There was a lot of discussion out throughout with a lot of HIV specialists across Australia as to whether this was something that could be managed. There were differing opinions, yes and no, but I think the government decided last week to drop it and said, look, we cannot progress this vaccine. We've, if there were no other candidates that were working, let's take it through and see if it works in phase three. But we've already got three which are giving signals of more than 90% efficacy. We've already bought a load of them to be um, produced and, and um, to be distributed in Australia. So why progress a vaccine that has that incredibly complex side to it? So I, I think it was the right decision. Um, it wouldn't have been an easy decision, and I am gutted for those people at UQ, but they know this is the nature of the beast, and I'm sure they'll come back with a new construct which will be used for future vaccines. So they, they, I've heard them being interviewed this week and they were very lovely about it and sort of very noble about it. And I can only imagine how the group feels, but I think it was the right decision. Katie, uh, thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll wrap up the questions there. Um, and I should say this was Katie's last uh, COVID presentation for the year. For this year, uh, yes. Stay here with us if you wouldn't mind. So oh. I'll ask Paul, Paul Lupo, the CR St Luke's Health Insurance, to come through and uh, wind up tonight. Just be, as Paul's coming forward, I should remind everyone we are videoing tonight's forum. So if you have friends that couldn't make it tonight or would like to more about it, it should be on the St Luke's or the Clifford Craig website within the next day or so. So stay tuned for that. Paul, would you come forward? Thanks, Peter, and uh, good evening all. Um, I'm obviously Paul Lupo, the CEO of St Luke's Health and I've been given the task to uh, thank Professor Flanagan tonight. But before doing so, you know, wow, how fortunate we are we here to have such talented uh, health professionals and researchers working and living in our patch of paradise. <laughs> Certainly after listening to Professor Flanagan, I'm now much better informed, and I hope you are as well, about how COVID works, how vaccines are developing in Australia and across the world, our prudent approach in Australia to learning from other countries' vaccination programs before we target vaccination programs here in Australia, and who our initial targeted populations for the vaccine might be. 
I think the future of health of Tasmania and indeed Australia is in good hands when we have people of the calibre of Professor Flanagan involved and organisations like the Clifford Craig Foundation helping fund critical medical research in our state. So to Professor Flanagan, thank you for giving up your time tonight to update us on uh, the COVID-19 vaccine process and where it's going at a time when I know that you're so busy with your research and other commitments. And as a token of our appreciation, I'd like to present you with a small gift. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. <laughs>